passed before the Roman armies came back, this time under Titus. That was the second siege now. And the Roman armies would not retreat again before they would do their doleful work. And you can read the story in the book Great Controversy. Titus tried to come to an agreement so that they could keep the battle away from the temple. But you know, we read in Great Controversy that even his own soldiers, those hardened, crusty soldiers, became infuriated at what they were witnessing happening in the city as women ate their own children, women and men alike, as children would rip the tiny morsels of food out of the mouths of their aged parents, as people would sneak out of the city just to look for a little weed or something they could eat. We're told that, that the people would even gnaw on the leather of their sandals trying to get just some little morsel of nourishment. And people would risk their life to go out and grab a few weeds or herbs, and if they made it back into the city without getting caught and crucified, they'd get into the city and it'd be taken from them. And as the Roman soldiers witnessed the atrocities happening inside the city, they could not withhold themselves any longer, and they finally stormed the city. And Titus had instructed his men not to go to the temple, not to destroy the temple, and he lost control of his own soldiers. And we're told that blood flowed like water down the steps of the temple. And the shrieks and screams and the, the groaning of the timbers as they broke and caved in amidst all the fiery flames. The destruction of Jerusalem. Well, how does this help us today? What do we learn from the story today? Once again, I turn to the spirit of prophecy where we find some help, a wonderful clue from Testimonies, Volume 5, pages 464 and 465. Here's what we read. The time is not far distant when, like the early disciples, we shall be forced to seek a refuge in desolate and solitary places. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight, to the Judean Christians, aha. So the assumption of power on the part of our nation in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. All right, do you see the parallel right now? It will then be time to leave the large cities preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes in secluded places among the mountains. Now, there's something I'd like you to know here, that, notice here, that's very important. It will then be time to leave, what's it say? The large cities. Now, there's something different here. You see, it's, it's as if Jerusalem was a microcosm of the end of the world, a little miniature of the end of the world. And now we have something more broad, more expansive, that when we would see the sign, we should embark on a process of leaving the large cities first. And anybody who's left the city, you know, it's a process. It takes time. Leave the large cities first, preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes and secluded places among the mountains. When we would see the sign, that is what we should do. Now, what's the first step when the sign should be seen? Leave the large cities. Okay. Now, that's interesting. We could talk about what a large city was in the time that this statement was written. Los Angeles was about 100,000 people at the turn of that century, around 1900. San Francisco was around 300,000, if I remember the numbers right. And Mrs. White said that, that our people should be miles out of that city. Now, what's the population of greater Chicago area? How many millions is it? Somebody says 8 million? All right, it will then be time to leave the large cities. Well, we've got to look at this because the question is, well, wait a minute, Dave. That says it refers us to the Sunday law. 
Well, if we're going to understand this from the Bible, how do we make that connection? Well, the siege around Jerusalem that we just studied was from Rome, the Roman armies. But all of you good Seventh-day Adventist Bible students know that there's two phases of Rome in Bible prophecy, right? What do we call that first phase? Pagan Rome. And that was Cestius and Titus, those generals, that was under pagan Rome. But I know you're a bunch of good Bible students here. You also know, and even the historians tell us, that pagan Rome handed the scepter to who? Papal Rome. And we find this prophecy in Revelation chapter 13 that lays this out. Gives us 11 points of identification for this beast in Revelation 13, verses 1 through 10. And it gives us, in those 11 points, a perfect description of the papacy. In fact, that is the only world power that fits all 11 points. One of those is that he receives his power and his seat from who? Somebody says the dragon, the devil. That's right. In Revelation chapter 12, there was that great red dragon. And we know that represents Satan. And we also know, as you study the prophecy there, that it represents the activities of Satan through pagan Rome. Because it was at the time that that child would be born, remember? Who would rule with a rod of iron. Who was that child? It was Jesus. That was pagan Rome ruling in the time of Jesus. And now that power and that seat and that authority are now given to this beast that represents the papacy. Now, <clears throat> this gets interesting because if we ask ourselves, what is the standard of papal Rome? What would their flag be that they would plant showing their intentions? You know what I love is that the Lord is so good to us he gives us His Word. He's blessed us with His Word through the Holy Scriptures, through the spirit of prophecy. But we find that even the beast will tell you what their sign is. You see, the word standard is a banner or a sign, right? And I think you all have heard this before, good Bible students that you are, that sign is can be used interchangeably with another wo word in the Bible. And that's a mark. A sign or a mark. Now here's what's amazing. Is that the beast has a sign or a mark. A sign of its authority. It's its flag, if you will. It's banner. It's standard. And what's amazing is the beast will tell you what that sign is, what that mark is. Now I don't recommend that we learn our lessons from the beast. But I just think it's amazing that the Lord doesn't want anyone to go with, without having ample opportunity to understand the truth. So he allows the beast to identify themselves. Isn't the Lord good? Listen to this. This is from a Catholic source. Of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act. It's talking about the change of the Sabbath. And the act is a what? mark of her, isn't it amazing they use the word, the beast uses the word, tells us what the mark is. The act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. Here's another one, Catholic source. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible. And this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact from the Catholic record, September 1, 1923. Now you say, but wait a minute. There in Testimonies, Volume 5, we read that the assumption of power on the part of our nation. How does our nation get into the picture? Well, if we keep reading in Revelation chapter 13, here's what we read. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Verse 11. Now, which power in the world is this talking about? The United States of America. We just sent a CD out. We send a CD out every month, a wake-up message to folks that are on our mailing list. We just sent one out a couple months back called The Voice of the Dragon. Friends, it's speaking like a dragon right before our eyes. It's happening. We're seeing the fulfillment of these things. And we go on and read that this beast, this second beast, the United States, exercises all the power of the first beast before it. Now, it's true. The first beast is before the second beast. That's obvious. But there's something more. If you look at the Greek there, it means before it <coughs> geographically. 
In other words, in his presence. He, in other words, he's the front man for the first beast. The United States, the front man for the papacy. That's right. That's what's being predicted here. And that's what we're seeing, by the way. Now, we've already stated what that sign or that standard is, Sunday sacredness. And you say, but wait a minute. The Sunday law hasn't been passed. Pastor Dave, you already said that the sign has come, but the Sunday law hasn't been passed. How does that work? Well, this is where we have to go back and look at history. But before we do that, I want to show you how I discovered this. And I believe we need the gift of prophecy as a people. It's not just something nice to have. It is a necessity to the people of God, and I praise God for it. And I found something in my study in the spirit of prophecy that absolutely changed our lives. It just rocked my world. And it has to do with a little pamphlet called Country Living. How many of you have that little pamphlet? There's quite a few hands here. Very good. And if you don't have it, you can go to our website, www.backtoenoch.org. And you can download a copy of that. Now, I was reading through this little pamphlet, and there's something that bothered me a little bit. I found general statements about the benefits of country living. I found statements that indicate that the time was coming we should leave. I found other statements that seemed to indicate the time had come, and I was a little confused. I was wondering, what is, what's going on here? Why do I find this mix of statements in the spirit of prophecy in that little pamphlet, Country Living? And I was pondering this one day. I, was, I still remember I was driving around in my car, and a thought came into my mind, and I believe the Lord was trying to help me out. And the thought was this. Maybe you should take the little booklet, Country Living, apart and lay those statements out in chronological order as to when they were written and see if a, if a harmonious pattern might emerge. And I thought, well, that would be very interesting. And I'm sorry to say I forgot about that for a few days. And, and uh, I was in the conference office one day waiting for an appointment. And it was as if the Holy Spirit tapped me on the shoulder and reminded me about that little project. And I had some time, so I ran downstairs to the ABC and I, I asked the manager, do you have a country living? And sure enough, there was one on the shelf, one left. And I went and I grabbed it and I flipped to the back page and here is the statement that we read just a few moments ago. You'll recognize it. On the back page of the book, Country Living, the very last page, under the heading, Emergency Flight and Closing Conflict. Now that heading was not provided by Mrs. White. It's the editors put that there. And uh, I'm not trying to suggest something sinister. I'm just pointing that out so you keep it in mind. But here is the statement that we read on the last page. The time is not far distant when, like the early disciples, we shall be forced to seek a refuge in desolate and solitary places. You recognize it? Here we go. I'm going to read it through. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation and the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. It will then be time to leave the large cities preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes in secluded places among the mountains. Now, I'm just going to put a few phrases up here so we keep them in mind as we go on. It started with the words, what? The time is not far distant. And then we saw it would then be time. My eyes dropped to the bottom of the page there in Country Living, and the date was there. 1885. You know, it turns out that this is one of the earlier statements on country living that's in the whole book, and it's on the last page. I flipped back a few pages. Now, please keep this in mind. I don't want to be too laborious here, but I want you to notice these phrases so you can see what happened to me as I was standing in the ABC that day. The time is not far distant. It will then be time. I flipped back a few pages, and my eyes fell on these words. The time has come when, as God opens the way, families should move out of the cities. The children should be taken into the country. I looked at the date. It was 1903. Are you catching where we're going with this? 
something happened between 1885 and 1903 that caused the prophet to go from saying, the time is not far distant, to what? The time has come. Something happened. I kept looking. I found this statement. This was 1906. Notice the heat's cranking up. Out of the cities. Out of the cities. This is the message the Lord has been giving me. The earthquakes will come. The floods will come. And we are not to establish ourselves in the wicked cities. I tell you, I got chill bumps. I was seeing the pattern already, and I hadn't even done the whole project of taking this little booklet apart. By the way, if you get Country Living off our webpage, you can download it as a PDF. You can read it on the webpage, or you can download it. It's in chronological order. We took the statements and put them in chronological order for you. All right. But I kept looking, and then the window began to narrow. I was looking for, when was it? When was the sign that would cause the prophet from going to, the time is not far distant, to, the time has come. And the window began to close. Look at this one. This is very important. You can also find this in 6T, Testimonies, Volume 6, page 195. What's it say? Get out of the large cities as fast as possible. You know when that was written? 1900. Why is that significant? Because Mrs. White told us when you see the sign, what's the first step? Leave the large cities. 1900, she said, get out of the large cities as fast as possible. Something happened between 1885 and 1900. And I kept looking. And the window narrowed down even more. I found an amazing statement. Before I read it to you, I want to take you back to the statement in Great Controversy that explains those Roman standards around the walls of the city so you can see the language because the parallel is impossible to miss when you look at this up close. Page 26, again, the Great Controversy. When the idolatrous standards, notice this, the idolatrous standards of the Romans should be what? Set up in the holy ground, which extended some furlongs outside the city walls, then the followers of Christ were to find safety in flight. Now, let this ring in your ears, okay? Watch this. Letter 90, 1897. The Protestant world have, what? Set up an idle Sabbath. Do you see the language? Yeah, the Lord is so good. It's, it's almost identical language. The Protestant world have set up an idle Sabbath in the place where God's Sabbath should be, and, f and they are treading in the footsteps of the papacy. If you keep reading, it says, For this reason I see the necessity of the people of God getting out of the cities. Wow, 1897. That's only 12 years after 1885. The question is, what happened between 1885 and 1897? What was the sign? Where was it? Something told me in the back of my mind that 1888 was an important year for more than just Minneapolis. And so I started to dig around, and what I found was, to me, quite amazing. Because in 1888, Senator H.W. Blair from New Hampshire brought a bill into Congress, which, if passed, would be the first federal Sunday law in the history of the United States. We call it now the Blair Bill. The Blair Bill. 